<laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today and share with you this morning. I'm going to go ahead and just start a timer just to make sure that I'm able to get in your questions today. So as she mentioned, my name is Lana Hardin. And today we're looking at speaking the language of social leads and understanding the fundamentals of social media. I'm a very engaging, interactive presenter, so I will be asking questions. And I'd like to start um, by going ahead and just talking about, she mentioned um, you know, some of the things we do. We'll go over the agenda. Well, I'll quickly just recap a little bit of what I'm actually doing now. And then we will actually just do a quick little short poll, uh, verbal poll. So today's agenda is that we're going to do our introduction to the session, and then we're going to talk about knowing your purpose. We're going to talk about knowing your message on social media, knowing your audience, knowing your channel, knowing your algorithm, the four basic social media marketing skills, tools and best practices. We'll take questions and answers, and then we'll do a quick wrap up. So that's our agenda for today. So, as she said, I am Lana Hardin, and she really was extensive in terms of my background, so I won't be redundant with that. Um, what I'd like to add that I didn't add is that I'm also a business owner. So I own actually two businesses, and consulting and professional de development and corporate training is one of my backgrounds. And I'm very passionate about helping businesses be able to navigate the new changing world. And I think that I always like to share that to let people know that when I I actually received my master's in digital marketing, I went back for my own business. So I understand the challenges that many people face when navigating online. So just wanted to go ahead and let you know that. So today's session is designed to teach you how to understand social media fundamentals, identify social media skills brands must master online, and then share some tips and tools to navigate the landscape successfully. So once again, thank you for joining. So quickly, on a scale from one to 10, if you guys can just kind of use your fingers and let me know, what is your current comfort level with social media? Oh goodness. All right, well, we have some nine, six, one. I'm, I understand that. Uh, I saw some uh, really strong, powerful nines in the back, and uh, I didn't see your hand. Five, okay. Well, we are, again, I'm engaging, so I'm gonna kind of ask uh, everyone in the room to respond and kind of let me know why you came into uh, this particular workshop, what you hope to get out of it, and if you don't mind sharing your role, and I, I can see there's different levels of, um, you know, expertise in the room, but I really want to make this as robust and helpful as possible. So I think that we will start um, here. If you can just tell me kind of your role and then why you actually joined us today. So uh, I'm Julie Harlan. I'm a realtor with Jakeway Realtors here in Kalamazoo. And I've been in it for about two years and social media has been a huge part of my business. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'm Kimberly. Um, so my role, my current role is very different. Like, just came here for more like knowledge and all that. I'm a clinical trials associate. So very not social media, but um, I actually just graduated from Western with a digital marketing major. So I'm just curious to see what I can gain from it. And the company that I'm currently working for is also a small business, so they do need help with um, social media stuff. I actually came on there as a digital marketing intern and then moved to a clinical trial role. So yeah, just seeing what I can do to help in small business and yeah, stuff like that. That's awesome. Congratulations on graduating. You're welcome. Um, my name is Roxy. I'm leader. I own a store called Decadent Dogs in South Haven. And um, I um, have all of the social media chan channels that I could possibly manage. So I think what I'm looking for is the algorithms. And, um, and if we get into a website and all the SEO and um, how those things can help boost 
Uh -huh. I tend to not pay for advertising on social media. I have just, at this point, pretty much been happy with the organic reach. Uh -huh. um, so I'm open to that. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. It's awesome. Thank you for sharing. I always love talking to business owners. Um, like you said, you're making a transition, and sometimes transitions can be hard, but kudos to you for taking the leap. So. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm Melanie DeVries. I actually work for the Michigan Small Business Development Center. So I'm part of a group called the Tech Team. We work with advanced technology companies and help them figure out how to commercialize the technology. So that's why I raised the nine. I actually have a background in marketing. Um, I'm just always making kind of extra clients so that I, I know what's going on. I can advise my clients. So. I always love having a nine in the room because mm -hmm. then you, could, you can co-facilitate. <laughs> So I will make I might tap into your expertise in terms of you just sharing just because I really do like to pour. I think what's nice and what I love about what I do is that I'm a multi channel marketer. So what you'll get today is more like robust than just so social media because it really does all blend together. And so that's what I like to kind of set the tone for. All right. So we're going to just start with. Um, before I go into knowing your purpose, that it took me a long time to understand that really social media is just really one big conversation online. And I, even in my own businesses, sometimes struggle with where do we get into the conversation, right? And it's knowing that sometimes you're leading the conversation, sometimes you're listening into the conversation, and then sometimes you're just kind of observing and building relationships with others who are already engaged. So I think that if I had one piece of advice on how to kind of approach it, it's just to understand that you are having a conversation about who you are, about your business and your brand. And knowing your purpose, I think, is really fundamental because when we start talking about um, metrics and when we start talking about analytics and we start talking about being able to measure our success, we have to know why we're on the platform in the first place. And so a lot of times I see clients and small business owners kind of following the trends and getting on board with other people. And it really kind of, as a marketer, kind of just makes me kind of tense up because no two businesses are the same. And we can see that just from being in this room. We can see the varying degrees of expertise and knowledge and background. And so it's really important that a brand kind of owns their own purpose. So when you're on social media, are you on social media for brand awareness? Are you on social media to um, increase sales for lead generation? Are you on social media to be an advocate for your organization? You really have to be clear when you're starting your social media journey on what is your purpose. If you are clear on your purpose, this will keep you from avoiding spending extra energy doing things that do not generate, right? They don't generate the revenue or the activities that you're looking for. So right now, a lot of companies have a whole team 
just dedicated to social media because of the nuances, because of all the platforms, right? But I'm assuming that most people in this room will be managing it by themselves. So that's my first thing is just to know your purpose. So the second thing, after you know your purpose, why am I on this platform? Is it to build my business? Is it to compete with my competitors? Is it to just simply have channels that people can um, have some inbound marketing, right? It's gonna lead people back to me, back to my website, right? The next thing is that you have to know your message. And a lot of times, I mean, you don't have to do deep brand development. Obviously, there are companies that are very successful with just jumping into the water, right? And just kind of engaging people online. But really, it means kind of stepping back and stepping outside and saying, what is my brand, right? What am I trying to convey? Um, who, who, we'll get into this, we'll get into the audience more, but what do I want people to know about my brand? What is my message? And the reason I'm saying that is because you want your message to be consistent. If it's real estate that I'm the number one top selling real estate person in the state of Michigan and I can get you closed in five minutes, all of your content really should be around your message, right? Even if it's different forms of content, you still want to make sure that your message is clear. And I think this is really important as you start to grow and scale because as you're bringing more people onto your company and as you're outsourcing work, you want to make sure that they know your message and that they are also, you know, duplicating who you are online and they're not deviating from that. So here's what we can focus on as a brand. We can focus on our brand story. We can focus on our brand message, right? And our brand message is completely different from why we're here and our purpose. This is what we wanna project, our brand voice, and then our brand identity, okay? So brand story. How many people are familiar with the book uh, called Story Branding? Okay, Story Branding by Don, it's an amazing book. He also does a workshop as well, which I've been through. Um, and so I'm going to kind of use some of his expertise and tell you that there are two parts of a brand story, right, when you're developing it. The first is, what is my story as a brand? How did we evolve and who are we? So you want to think about that before you get online, right? Again, if you take the time to do these things, it's going to inform your content. So that's number one. But number two is, what is my customer story? What is my customer story? And if you understand your customer story, then you can position yourself to be that resource that the customer is looking for, even in your content as you're developing it online, right? So there's two parts of that brand story that you kind of want to write down as you go forward, is knowing your own story as a brand, and I kind of emphasize this because a lot of times I see brands online that have, especially small business owners, that have amazing backgrounds, amazing history, and they have an amazing why, and they're not sharing that. They're just showing up online. They're not talking about how many weeks it took them to get their license or how they had to come into a market that was tanking and, and be successful. And customers gain confidence in that when you are sharing that and they understand your history and also your message and your why so I think that's really important another thing that he shares in the book which is why I brought it up is that really when you're approaching people online even though you'll have your story it's always remembering that the customer is the hero in the story you're just the support system that comes along to be that you know that Batman you're the Robin but you always want to come back and make that customer shine and feel like after they engage with you, their life, whatever their situation, their problem will be resolved and it'll be transformed. So that's brand story. Brand message, again, your brand messaging is really about, you know, even though we've conveyed our story, what is our message? What do we want um, people to know about us? Even if it's just a trademark or a tagline, right? We are like, um, we, we um, I don't know what to say about collections because it is a tricky industry, but <laughs> like, uh, what's your message? Our message is that um, we slash your accounts. 
by 60 percent and we help get your credit resolved. Right. That's our message. Like I have my story of why I started doing collections and why collections is a passion to me. But here's my message to you. This is what we do and this is why we do it. So this is our message. Right. So you want to make sure that you have some type of seamless message that you are actually delivering as well. And then you want to come up with creative ways to, again, do that across different types of content. So. All right. So next is our brand voice, right? And I'm giving you guys this branding because normally I like to take companies through like a branded development process. But this is one of the things we do. Um, we just talk about if your brand was a character, who would it be, right? Who would your brand be? If you could pick a movie character or um, you could pick some other type of um, hero, who would it be, right? And this is important. Um, I'm going to give you guys something. If you look up brand archetypes, it's A-R-C-H-E-T-Y-P-E-S. There are some online platforms that will allow you to take a quiz and do a quick, you know, synopsis of your brand archetype. So this kind of goes with your brand voice. So I'm going to mix it so you guys get an understanding. So my brand voice, when I first started my, my um, I do I also sing and I also write books and stuff like that. So when I was first doing my brand development, um, my brand character was Princess Diana. Yes, and it was long before everyone was talking about her. <laughs> it was long before Megan, it was long before. And the reason I loved her is because people called her the people's princess. And she was very like, you know, she was pristine, she was classy and she was a royal, but yet she would sit at the side of AIDS patients' beds and she would hold their hand. And I just loved that about her. So for me, that was what I connected with. And so being able to just kind of go in and do deeper work around who she was and some of the actual qualities that defined her, I began to list those things out. And this is what you can do in your brand. Like she was powerful, right? She was compassionate. She was, um, she was um, someone that people looked up to, right? And this will help you to define your brand voice. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because a lot of brands will skip this and that's fine if you want to. There are simpler ways to do social media. We see people doing it all the time. However, as you begin to build and expand and you want other people to duplicate your voice, you'll need to have those thoughts so that when they're creating content or even if you're outsourcing it, you can say, hey, this is my brand voice and this is what I need you to make sure you're coming off. This is the tone I need to be set, right? So the archetype is a little bit different, but again, it's just a helpful thing that I like to do because you can go through and it'll kind of tell you your brand personality. And for instance, mine is a magician, right? That was mine. Well, what does that do? A magician is somebody that can kind of work magic and, you know, take something out of nothing and just all of a sudden change things. And so when you're building your content, you're going to, again, how is your content translating? Are you coming across as the brand who can do that? Right. So that's what I want to say about brand voice. And then your brand identity is really your visuals. Just making sure that your visuals are all across the board the same on all your platforms, that your um, colors are even conveying the mood and that when people interact with your brand online, they're able to see some consistency with your brand, brand identity. So that's what that is. Thank you. All right. Well, we we have some text missing, but this is know your audience, right? Know your audience. OK, so I may get on my soapbox for a little bit and I'll try not to be on it too long mm -hmm. <laughs> because I hear everybody talking about target audience. And and I do think that's great because it's true. Right. Target audience and demographics and psychographics and all of those things are important. But at a very basic level, know your audience. And I always give this 
example, um, during the introduction, she mentioned that I did work with Silicon Valley startups, right? And the last startup, which was a very big passion of mine because I was a caregiver to both my parents for 16 years. And, um, you know, they were building these funnels for the caregivers and reaching out and stuff. And, you know, they're on Facebook. And so I'm saying, what caregiver has time to spend on Facebook? Do you think a caregiver has time to spend on Facebook, right? So I think that knowing your audience is not just like, you have to know where your audience is, right? Your audience is not always on Facebook or your audience, depending on the age, may not be on Instagram, right? I'm from Generation X. Most of our generation, TV is still a huge part of what we do. So it's knowing even your media stream, right? Because again, even though you may be on social media, you'll have a different purpose. What I mean by that is I had a company, for instance, I worked with one of my first clients actually when I started my, uh, my um, freelancing was a music licensing company out of uh, California. They own over 500 radio stations. They do a lot of film licensing and everything like that. And they really wanted to reach those, you know, music people that were in film scoring and all of that. And so a lot of those people are creative. So they're not just hanging out on social media. Right. So as we begin to build our strategy, we had to look at and this again is just extra nothing to do with social media, but we had to look at trade shows. We had to look at other media streams to do that. But then at the same time, how were we using social media? Where our competitors already had a certain number of followers, so we at least had to do our competitive, competitive analysis and at least have the same presence, if not bigger, than our competitors. Let me know if that makes sense. Right. So knowing your audience is key. And I and I encourage you to really do that. And a way to do this is not just using data online, but even speaking to some of your customers and doing some other like kind of data digging in terms of surveys or whatever would be helpful for you. It's something you need to take time to do. And so this ties into the know your channel again. Where are they hanging out? You know, are they now there is a mobile app apping and things like that. Are they hanging out on TikTok, which we know TikTok is really, really huge now. Right. And there's ways to leverage that. Are they hanging out on Clubhouse? Right. A lot of people aren't leveraging Clubhouse. But can you do a real estate workshop where you're giving tips and inviting people to Clubhouse as another inbound effort? So don't get stuck with just the typical um, channels really dig down and see which channel your audience is on all right and then so we want to understand that there are different type of channels so there's a secret channels channels like YouTube and Pinterest where people are actually coming to seek out information and they want longer content because of that and then there is just engagement channels right where people just literally want to engage. They may want to be entertained. They may want to like just read really short forms of content. So you also just want to understand the different types of engagement channels. All right, and here's one of the things we talked about, algorithm, right? Which is such a loaded topic. <laughs> I think that one thing to understand about algorithms, which probably everyone already knows, is a lot of these companies are in the business to make money, right? So unless you grow your audience and do have a lot of organic reach, social media, you may get two to five percent conversion is really kind of where it's at. And so a lot of times, especially with if you're starting a basic page, people won't even see your post, right? So because of the way the algorithm is, so it's frequency, but it's also what type of content you're creating. And it's also shareability, because one of the things that happens is if people start sharing their content or sharing your content, then the algorithms automatically boost it up and they begin to share it. And that's one way that you can save in terms of advertising. Another thing to understand about algorithms is that 
keyword research is huge in the algorithms. So you definitely want to make sure that you take the time to research your keywords and that you are consistently building a strategy into your content creation to include your keywords. Because as people will do that, you know, and will look on the, the platforms or even sometimes just in Google or the search engines, then um, again, your content will come up. The other piece of it is this, that <clears throat> also, um, when it comes to algorithms, you want to make sure you're engaging. So let's say with LinkedIn, you know, people get up in the morning, you post or whatever, which the mornings are typically a really good time to post, first of all, because you're automatically starting off. Right. But you also want to spend some time engaging on other posts. And there's a way to do that, especially with business pages. You can engage with other business pages as a page. So you want to make sure that you're going and liking other content that's relevant. And you want to also just make sure you're commenting um, if people are um, sending you messages, making sure that you're answering messages right away, which is why some people use the bots. So all of these things can help um, in terms of the algorithm. Um, I won't go into it because it's a whole like I just did an eight hour training. It's like a 10 hour training to really get into SEO and things like that. But um, just know everything you want to have your keywords across your websites. You want to make sure that um, your 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 channels are linking so that it's matching content, because all of that, even as other people are um, linking back to you, it's going to affect the algorithm. So let me give an example. We were talking this morning about the Women's Business Network, right? I haven't seen the Women's Business Network. Uh, website, but if I was a member of it, my company is listed in what I do, it's still going to influence the algorithm because there are people that are pointing back to my business. So even having a Google My Business profile and making sure that your social channels are linked properly on different channels is going to impact your algorithm. So thank you for that. So here are the four basic social media marketing skills. I, got, I had to start with social selling. How many think that we're only on social media to sell? Right. How many get frustrated when you get an, I do, I don't know about you, but <laughs> when I get a LinkedIn request from someone and I actually accept them and then the next thing you know, they're in my inbox sending me something and asking for my time as if I know them. <laughs> I, it takes everything in me, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I, I don't, um, I don't think that brands understand that social selling is really only 10% of what it is that you should be doing. It's building relationship and it's engaging as we talked about a conversation. And so we're going to talk about, yes, you're going to, obviously you want to sell, but everything you're doing online when you're interacting with people is, 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 in, is really selling, right? Because you're selling yourself, you're selling your brand and who you are. So the next is the social networking piece. So that is who who are you connecting to online right what groups are you a part of what forms like are you sharing your expertise in a way um, are you posting blog posts that people can um, come read and then you know network with you and building these relationships so that's a huge part of it as well but the social influencing I think sometimes when we get to social influencing a lot of people think about influencers but you're really influencing every day and you want to influence people in a way that makes them look to you as as the leading solution right so this is another skill when you're creating content and it, this seems so straightforward but a lot of times companies don't necessarily infuse these principles into the content they're creating so maybe you need to think about having your social influencing how are you going to influence what type of content will you actually create to do that, right? To move your message forward. And then this one to me is the most valuable that you can possibly have is that social listening skill. What are people saying? Because this again goes back to um, 
the algorithm and the trends and things like that. I'll give this example. It's very random, but it's just the quickest one I can think of. I was attending a grant workshop last night and uh, the presenter has raised like three million dollars for her projects or whatever art projects. And she was talking about writing the grant and she said, you don't write a grant that doesn't align. Good morning. <laughs> I knew who it was. <laughs> That's why I stopped. <laughs> I don't know if I can tell you I'm on camera. This is my score mentor when I first started and now and now a dear friend. But thanks for stopping in. So um, I was just saying that basically um, she was talking about creating this grant. Right. And, and being able to write it for actually some of the issues that are going on. So we know that the election just happened. Right. And everyone was buzzing around that. So you still want to have your content be relevant to your business with your message. But maybe you want to deliver it in a way that, you know, incorporates what people are already talking about. So that's why social listening will kind of tell you what content to create. So you're not all over the place. And then you want to be listening for your industry as well. Right. Making sure that you're listening for uh, what are some changing things that you can get ahead of and and be able to present yourself in, as an authority. Is there anyone using social listening right now? What do you guys think about social listening? I'm going to be honest with you and I don't want to. I am. So I'm Generation X, right? I see the millennials are really good at, at social listening, right? They'll ask a question. Hey, I'm getting and not just millennials. I've seen other people do it, but you know, some of my friends are, so I just notice it. Hey, I'm, I'm thinking about doing X, Y, Z. Would you choose a B or C? Right. And then they're creating products based on what other people are saying, as opposed to going out and just working. Right. So we need to use this even with our content. This strategy works like, Hey, you know, what do people need? And I'll provide some resources that are really good to help with this um, at the end. But I just wanted to kind of go over that. Oh, and here we are with our resources. So here's some recommended tools and best practices. Um, before I go over this list, what I realized I did this before and I've since done a content marketing class. So I'd like to give you guys a little bit more in terms of different types of content. Um, that you can think about when you're creating content. So what do you guys think? Let's 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 just hear some things in the room. What do you think some different types of content are? Well, I always inform my customers of any events coming up and um, just kind of talk about dogs in general. Okay, that's good. Anyone else? Video? Video is definitely huge. People love a video. So that's definitely one that I say is a different type of content. Anyone else? Oh, I, a lot of, um, of the infographics now. People infographics. Like yes. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Short stories, yep, short form content. Yep, absolutely. Anyone else? There's. I do want to add something. Uh, what you said about the millennials and the ABC. So I have a friend who's a woman business owner as well. And she posts similar things, nothing to do with her business, which is HR. Um, but it draws people in. So I speak to them about the dog thing, which is a favorite place. But I volunteer for different things. And so that's what drove my, drove my mind. But like I said, she. Things, the choices, the, or the questions, the choices have nothing to do with her business, but it draws people into her Facebook page. Absolutely. And so surveys and polls are also a different type of content. Right, then, then what they see, then they're sharing it, which drives your algorithm. Right, yep, absolutely. Um, blogs are types of content. Um, some people are doing interviews with other people and podcasting is a uh, different type of content. I'm actually going to give you guys my email address because I feel like this would be helpful for you as there's probably like over 20 to 30 different types of 
um, content that you can create online. So I really want to share the list with you. So if you email me um, after today, I actually will give you all of my resources. They're like five pages that I have on SEO and content marketing that I actually do with my corporate training. So hopefully that will help. But just be creative with your content. You have photographs, right? Um, like she said, infographics. It's really just delivering the information in a different way. And sometimes you can repurpose content. Um, and thinking about SEO and capturing keywords, one thing I always recommend to people, and it's just my recommendation, but <laughs> you can take that or you can leave it is, um, when I work with clients, I try to build evergreen types of content because if you build evergreen, which means that it's gonna last forever. So like every holiday, I'm definitely already going to create a post about the holiday because every Christmas, once that post is out there, people are going to keep looking for that and it'll just keep, you know, being able to be repurposed and reused. So this is what we think about evergreen content. It's just things that are going to live on the Internet and always be relevant. So. I always like, especially with small business owners, so that you're not spinning your wheels trying to create things that you're going to have to go back and be like, oh, you know, and you're not going to get traction out of it anyway. So that's just something to think about. So here are some recommended tools and best practices. And like I said, I am going to share more and there, there's several more if you want to take on that task. But the keyword research is huge. So just start there, like start with your keyword research. There are tools like Arif's. Um, some of those are cost tools, but you can use Google keyword research. Um, you can use Majestic, and a lot of them have free trials anyway. Um, there's one called SpyFu, S-P-Y-F-U. Take the time to really learn the keywords on, in your industry. And not just the ones that are in the algorithm, but also what is the language of your industry and what are people using? I think you need to actually include that in your keywords. Um, Google is a huge resource. Like if you go to Google and you literally start typing about your industry, you're going to see the major things that people are talking about, right? Another tool that I love that I'm going to share with you is called KeywordTool.io. OK, they have a paid subscription, but they also have a free version. You can literally go in and if you're looking for keywords in Google or uh, or Amazon or like any other of the channels, it'll tell you what the top keywords are. Right. And you can take that list and begin to just create content. And then Google Trends. When I was talking to you about social listening, I think this is a great tool that you can use because you can set up, um, you can go, well, it's two. You can go to Google Trends and look at the trends that people are talking about and it's going to tell you your top trends. And then you can also use Google Alerts. Is there anyone using Google Alerts now? Isn't it overwhelming? <laughs> <laughs> so I suggest creating a separate email account unless you just do your weekly. But even then, I find that it can be very um, taxing to look through it all. So I would just like create a separate account, set up your Google alerts. These are the things you want to be alerted about. And it's going to send you news articles every day about your industry and things like that. So it's definitely worth it. Um, and even if you're not looking at it every day, when you're sitting down actually doing your content and strategies, you can still just go to it and go like, OK, what? And sometimes it's helpful just to even get ideas like sometimes you don't even have to create come up with content. You can just repurpose and point back to what content that's already out there. Right. Um, which leads me to something that I wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about um, the different types of content and posting is that make sure you're pointing them back to do something, giving them a call to action. Don't just be posting just to post, right? Whether it's like watch this video, whether and you're including a link or something to, you know, sign up with me or, or have a free consultation, leverage your posts so that people can take action. And another thing I, I want to include and it's something to think about is have a homebound strategy. Don't just you know, be out posting and sending people out to these channels that are not going to bring people back to you. The whole goal is to bring people back to your website and to get them to interact with you and to capture their data so that when Facebook goes out like it did 
or Instagram goes out. Like you don't, you lose your whole entire customer base, right? All right, so the next thing is Feedly. Is there anyone using Feedly? I love Feedly, tell us about Feedly. <laughs> Yeah, and I love I love it because if you follow major publications, a lot of times you can go and type it in and it'll automatically bring it into your RSS feed. So you're not having to go out and look at it, right? You're not having to go search it, but all of them are coming in. There's a search feature. So let's say you do Forbes every day or, you know, Women's, Women's Inc. or something like that. You can literally like type it in, add it to your feed, and then it'll pull those things in for you. And again, this is something to help you manage time so that like when you're ready to do your content, you could just go and just like read it and not have to be searching for what you want to talk about. Um, so other than that, uh, there are free photo sites. Um, what's that? Put that twice but there's free photo sites when you actually um email me if you choose to i'll include a lot of free photo sites and we all know canva has right a lot of photos the thing about canvas they can be regurgitated so you still may want to have some free photo sites is anyone using canva okay yeah i love canva <laughs> and they just keep adding to it which is awesome for those of you who don't know what canva is there anyone who doesn't know what canva is okay so canva is, it was started by a graphic designer to just make things a lot easier so they have a lot of templates that you can use for social media for anything you can think of even video um templates like if you want to do your um your ma your uh, what is it called? I'm thinking of it right now. Um, your thumbnails, your thumbnails. They have over I can't even tell you how many, and it's so easy. You can add your logo. You can do um, make um, photos and logos transparent. It's so many features. Um, you can go to YouTube and just put in Canva, and I'm sure there'll be like a bunch of tutorials that come up. I think it's a small business owner's friend, to be honest. <laughs> Um, but Adobe Spark is another one um, that's really good with making videos. Uh, anyone familiar with Adobe Spark? Uh, yeah, they have photos and you can do postings, but they also have videos and you can add captions. Um, you can edit the videos and do short videos. Uh, I think we all know about iMovie. Um, I wanted to tell you guys about a couple that uh, I have to email you. I think... Uh, I'm mixing it up with a tool now, but there's actually two that I recently found that I love because you could do memes on them. Um, and uh, you can also, when you see people on YouTube and they're adding those really nice graphics and captions at the bottom, you can also play with those. So I'll add those for you as well. Anyone familiar with Hootsuite or Buffer? Yeah, so these are scheduling tools, right? To make your life easier. Um, do you guys know you can schedule also directly through Facebook? Yeah, I'm like, save time because now, you know, the paid accounts are getting more, but it's also another good tool for listening. You can listen into conversations that are happening as well. And for me, it just helps to make your life easier um, because you can just work on your social media either once a week or, you know, whatever it is and go ahead and schedule it out. Okay, this is a great friend. Anyone know about InShot? InShot is a mobile app and it's so easy to make videos on InShot. You can make the video right on your phone and then you can add music to it. You can add graphics and colors and make it look just like a professional video. A lot of people on LinkedIn use it and you can literally just share from, from there. So it's a great way to just do quick little videos on your phone. All right, Sprout Social is another um, scheduling tool that's really good. And um, I don't know if there's any other tools that you guys wanna share or, or talk about, there are a lot of them. So you kind of have to choose what works best for you and then just leverage it from there. All right, and now 
I'd like to just go into a quick Q&A and if there are topics that you want to dig down more into, I'd love to do that. Uh, we have kind of like 15, and I know I talked really fast too, so if you have questions, please feel free to ask them now. Okay. So do you think you should have the exact same post going out on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn? I realize I have different audiences, but sometimes people that I follow, it's kind of annoying to see the same <laughs> exact post on yeah. site. Yeah, yeah. And it's tricky because as a small business owner, you don't have a lot of time. When you start outsourcing, then I think you can do more. I think if you can put different types of content, it's great, especially if you're thinking about LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is more B2B, um, which goes back to your audience. Um, but to be honest with you, I do think it's going to be tricky to do that. One thing, I'm going to give you two suggestions that, that, that have helped and I've heard about as well, is... If you do a video, it's nice because you can take the video and break down little pieces. Like, let's say you do a longer video on YouTube, right? You can still break that down and repurpose it and use it for promos online. Um, and you could think about your content in that way, too. Like, here, I'm going to develop this big piece for this platform, but I'm going to do this with this smaller piece, right? Um, someone also suggested, which I thought this was great in terms of, like, TikTok videos is that you can do like, let's say you do a 12 minute video on TikTok and you're doing different scenes. You do all the video at once, but then you like pause for a few seconds between each so that when you're done, you literally can just take that video, splice it down and then use that across the board. But to your question, um, I think it's something to consider. I think it's harder for small businesses to manage because Content creation takes time, but if you can do it, I definitely think you should. Okay. Yeah, you. you're welcome. Anyone else? So last year, live videos were the thing, but now this year, our reels, this year's thing, <laughs> should we switch to reels? Well, what platform are you on? Because that's what I think is good. Like, if you're on TikTok and other platforms like that, I definitely think Reels are the thing right now. Okay. Um, but it's it's trying to, because right now a lot of people are just going, uh, I don't know if it's because of the pandemic, but a lot of people just want to be entertained <laughs> right now. So, and, and, and when I work with clients, I think every client can have an entertaining factor. Even if it's telling a story about like, the worst real estate experiences in the world. Like, I think there are ways you can think about how can you still be entertaining to do some of those things that you're talking about or like tips, you know, I want to give five tips and then do it. But I do think people are using reels. Does everyone agree? Which would you prefer to watch? I guess I should ask. Between TikTok and reels, are you asking? Reels and just regular videos. I do too, but sometimes I'm like, oh, let's get back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which goes back to knowing your audience because, but you know, I wanted to tell you this and it's so true. And, and most people know this because you're with pets. When you have pets, no, you don't have to do anything. You can literally just post a pet. Those are the top two is like children and pets in the marketing world. Everyone knows that like, so you are already kind of, <laughs> I saw someone who, <laughs> they posted a TikTok and their dog was literally just watching TV. They weren't doing anything and it had like a lot of different views, you know. So um, is there any more questions? I want to ask this because you asked the question about the um, search engine optimization. Does everyone have a Google My Business account? Okay. If you don't, make sure, because that's, again, part of the algorithm. Um, if you are part of any professional associations or things like that, or you've done any type of programs, make sure you're posting that as well, um, because that, again, is going to help you. 
um, they we used to do a SEO a lot of um, in terms of directories which are kind of outdated now but I still think you should include them if you can make sure that um, like things like Yelp or other places where your trade is or your industry is well trafficked I don't know what real estate if you're on real some of those search engines or whatever but just know that those things do um, make a difference um, it's just something that I wanted to share that oh and your reviews does everyone have reviews as well? That actually does filter into the algorithm. So make sure that if you can get reviews, I have one client and she literally just makes it a part of her like plan to automatically ask for a review. And sometimes even if she does like free things and f consults, oh, you can thank me by going and leaving a review. But even on your social platforms, reviews are still, still good and they're gonna help. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a physician assistant and a healthcare provider, and I know that a lot of my colleagues last year, like she was saying, were doing like lives where people could come in and ask questions, mostly on Facebook. Do you feel like that's still a valuable thing, or is that kind of no longer? I don't want to give my opinions because I want to be helpful, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes back to audience because people just don't have time. Like, and people don't want to spend their time, like, always in those kind of settings. Um, I just think it depends on, as opposed to a live, like, maybe talking to people about, like, here's what we're seeing, and this is how we want to help. I think if you're always helping people, I think it, regardless of what type of content, um, you may do a live, but maybe it'll be once a month, and maybe you'll post in advance so people know, so you're not just randomly online and then people are, you're not capturing anything. But I think again, that would go back to social listening. Like what are people, and you can post that and be like, hey, thinking about doing a live on XYZ about this, who would like to attend? And that's gonna let you know if you should even take the time to invest in it, so. Well, that's what we were, I think you were in here. I, so do you know what, like, what's your age demographic and who you're, who we Okay, I don't want to start giving you random information, but I mean, Pinterest is a really good platform and women love Pinterest. So it's just finding out where people are. Maybe if you're going to like groups, women's groups on Facebook and you're being really targeted in your approach, I think that it could potentially yield but just randomly posting the algorithm, I don't even think would give you what you're looking for. Um, but then again, this is where email marketing comes in. This is where potentially doing the surveys and polls come in. Facebook is, t to me, I I'm gonna be honest, I'm getting, uh, okay, I can't. <laughs> be honest. They've changed their name. Uh, does anyone know they changed their name now? Yeah, I'm going to, I mean, I don't know. For me, I'm on, I have a pretty decent presence. Um, I don't post a lot because of all the things I do, but I think a lot of people, what I'm seeing now is them creating strategies to pull people off of these channels because the truth is they can shut down at any time. And if that's where your revenue streams are coming from, you may be, you know, but pulling people into webinars or, um, I mean, like I said, Clubhouse is one that people are using or, you know, people are even integrating their own mobile apps and taking people and funneling them there. So just get creative. Use social media as like your first, you know, here's the front door, but I really want you to be in this back room with me, right? Um, so I think that's a good approach. Anyone else? Do you think email lists are still fairly good? I'm trying not to bring my... <laughs> They, uh, uh, you know, people are really moving towards text. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that has even become like, I'm like, I never should have given you my number. <laughs> but it's a good strategy. I would much rather, and it's, it's like a trend. People are like using texting a lot more now. Mm -hmm. Things like Twilio, which are easy to set up and you can contract out. So I'm not going to say that email is, is dead because it's valuable to have a list. But a lot of times I just see brands oversaturating people in their inbox. And then they, it kind of becomes like 
you tune people out, right? If it's too much, um, but especially when it comes to events or just reminders or sales or things like that, I think texting is a good strategy to start looking at. And you can use your platforms to cross promote. So you can say, hey, you know, you have a post, follow us, you know, text us if you want to follow us. Some of our things, you know, aren't online or something. I've seen a lot of people take that and, and do it. So, and yes. I've had a reluctance to use text because I like to think that texts are private, you know. So, I don't know, my dentist texts me, I don't mind that. But I don't think I would be really in favor of seeing a store text me. Does anybody else feel that way? Oh, it looks like I a... mostly um, Thank you. Yeah, you definitely have to opt out. I need to close because it is a uh, time tile, but I'm going to say this. I enjoyed getting that text about that Macy's sale last night. <laughs> You have to think through the eyes of the customer because the way trends are moving, it's going to be automation and automation, that automation, you don't have to text them this, it does it for you. So it may be something I would strongly suggest you consider in your long-term strategy. All right. Well, I kept you guys. Yes. I appreciate you guys again today coming with me. Um, here is my contact information. If you actually email me, I would love to share any resources and tips that I can with you as you continue navigating the social media terrain. Uh, again, my name is Lana Harden, and I just want to thank you for your time as well. Thank you, thank you guys. <laughs>